So we've seen the size of atoms and the energies involved in them. Now let's look at the forces involved. In particular, I want to ask how strong a piece of material can be. Let's say, for example, we had a rope and you're suspending a weight on it. This gives you a tension inside the rope as every bit of the rope pulls apart from everything else. If we zoom in on some bit here, we'll see all the individual atoms on the left and all the atoms on the right being pulled sideways with the tension force. So for that particular bit of the rope not to break, the force supplied by all these bonds must be enough. But how can we work out a force? What we know is the energy, energy of about 10 to the minus 18 joules in a bond. And we know the size. The size is about 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. But how do we get a force out of that? Well, one way is to use the concept of work. Where work is a change in energy, and it's equal to force times distance. So the energy must be equal to the force times the distance. We know what the energy is. We know what the distance is, the size of an atom. So that means a characteristic force is going to be roughly the energy, 10 to the minus 18 over 10 to the minus 10. So it would be about 10 to the minus 8 newtons. So we've got a characteristic energy, a characteristic length, divide one by the other, and that will give us a characteristic force. Another way to think of it is that force can be defined as the gradient of an energy curve. So if you remember, if we plot the energy against the distance, we get a curve that looks something like this. And whenever you get a curve like that, the force involved is a gradient. So for the equilibrium point down here, this curve is flat, which means it doesn't take any force to move something sideways. So that's if you've got two atoms at their normal chemical bond strength, you can pull them slightly without any effect. As you pull them further and further apart, you go up to about here, when you've got the maximum gradient. That corresponds to you pulling one of the atoms away from the other, and the bond gets stronger and stronger. Then eventually, if you pull harder, there's now not so much force, and you can just drag them away. That's like when they're very far apart, the bond is mostly broken, and they're easy to pull apart. Likewise, if you push them together, the force goes the other way, you've now got an opposite gradient. And as you push them closer and closer, they repel each other more and more crazily, and so the slope gets steeper and steeper. So that's about what you expect. If you take a piece of rope or something like that, and you pull it a little bit, it can oscillate backwards and forwards, vibrate. If you pull it a lot, it will stretch, and then eventually it'll go past the yielding point and snap. So the slope here is going to give you some measure of where the thing breaks. And once again, the gradient of that is roughly the energy here divided by A. I mean, it might be one and a half times E over half times A or something like that. But it's going to be, roughly speaking, this figure we've calculated over here. OK, so how does that match to the actual strength of material? Well, let's say we've got one square metre of material. And you're pulling this way that way, and you're looking at the bonds between the atoms on this side and the atoms on that side. You know, each bond has a needs a force of about 10 to the 8, 10 to the minus 8 newtons. But how many bonds are there? Well, let's assume on this cut face here, we said that each atom is about 2 by 10 to the minus 10 meter across. Okay, another atom here. So basically, you put each atom in a square. How many atoms do you have? Well, you've got n across, where n is 1 over 2 by 10 to the minus 10. This is assuming that the 10 to the minus 10 radius is a radius, not a diameter. That's how many you've got across. Same downwards, so the total number is that squared. So the total force you're going to get, you need that much force to overcome each bond, because a lot of the bonds, is going to be that times 10 to the minus 8.
And that comes out as about 2 by 10 to the 11 pascals. Pascal being Newton per square metre. So it's a 10 to the 11 Newtons for a 1 square metre cross-sectional area. Which is pretty strong. That's because there's of order 10 to the 20 atoms. Either way, each is quite, quite small. That's a lot of them. How does that compare to actual materials? Well, you can measure what's called the yield strength of different materials, which is how much force per unit area they can take before they break. High quality steel, it's about 10 to the 9 pascals. So that's quite a bit worse. 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, that's about 200 times worse than the theoretical limit. However, there are synthetic polymers, things like aramid, Kevlar, which are rather better. Uh, so they are up to about five times stronger, so about five by 10 to the 9. But that's still quite a bit less than our theoretical value. The very strongest yield strength of anything we have are things like actual carbon nanofibers. We actually got carbon bonds arranged perfectly. You can only make them in very small quantities. You can't make big things out of them. Uh, things like um, but carbon nanotubes. They can get up to about 6 by 10 to the 10 pascals. So they're now getting to within about a factor of 2 or 3 of that. So that's actually not particularly bad agreement. What it's telling us is that the actual strength of bonds is quite a bit bigger than the strength of most practical materials like steel or even Kevlar. Only things like carbon nanotubes, where you actually have all the bonds lined up very perfectly, get even close to this. Of course, this uh, energy is probably higher than most bonds, so that might be a little bit of a high value, but it's telling us there is actually some room for improvement. In practice, the way most materials fail is not that the bonds break. Let's say you have a bit of, say, a piece of paper, and you have a defect in it, like a little cra crack or something like that. When you stretch it, the stress will concentrate around the crack, and so the crack will tend to tear sideways and rip the whole thing apart. And the same thing applies to realistic bits of steel. They have defects, they have boundaries between the microscopic crystals inside it, and it's these things that tend to pull apart rather than the actual bonds. So if you could actually arrange it so there were no defects and all the bonds are perfectly lined up, which is what you get in something like carbon nanotubes, you can get close to this theoretical limit. But in most substances, you're quite a long way off.